Great. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so thanks for joining today, everyone. This is our second session on conversations on DEI and scientific events. Um, this is organized by myself. I'm an ASP postdoc at NCAR and um, others in my lab group um, in the research applications lab. So if you missed the first session, a little motivation on this series, um, we had conversations among our lab group about, you know, there's all this um, talk about, you know, increasing DEI in many different avenues. And we noticed, despite these talks, these were not actually being translated into action. Um, particularly in scientific events like meetings and workshops. Um, so we're talking about this and, you know, how we can address this issue. So we came up with doing this seminar series um, loosely based on this awesome guide um, called Inclusive Scientific Meetings, um, which was written by um, many people you might know uh, among the science, different science institutions. Um, and we reached out to these authors to see if they'd be willing to present some of the some of the expertise that they've learned about how to create an inclusive scientific meetings. And then, um, you know, by sharing this information, we're hoping to facilitate more discussion around some of these issues and also um, basically create tools that you can bring back to your own spheres of influence, your own institution to help promote um, creating more inclusive scientific events. So. Um, just some ground rules before we get started during the presentation if you could please mute yourself that would be awesome um because we are talking about dei um it's worth just noting please be kind please be respectful of others views and opinions um and make sure to listen to others perspectives which might be different than your own um and so the format for today we're going to kick off with a presentation by dr angie pendergrass um that is going to talk about uh, humanizing the culture of science by focusing on scientists coming together, inclusive scientific meetings. Um, and Angie one, was one of the original, actually the lead author on the inclusive meetings guide. So we're really excited to hear from her. Um, and she is an assistant professor at Cornell University. So we'll hear from Angie and then we'll move into breakout discussion rooms um, where we have some guided questions. And then um, we'll use the remaining time to ask questions to Angie via Slido. Um, so you should see a link in the chat to the Slido link so you can submit questions there and we'll revisit those at the end. Um, so that's the format for today. Um, and so let's just jump right into it. So Angie, um, if you would like to further introduce yourself and start sharing your presentation, that would be awesome. Okay, so can you see my slides? Yes, looks good. Okay, um, awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so Aaron asked me to give a little bit of an extended introduction. And um, since I wanted to kind of frame what the goal of the inclusive scientific meeting kind of guide and effort was, was kind of humanizing science. Uh, so I thought I would give a little bit of an extended introduction of myself as a human, since I know many of you mostly in science roles. Um, and presumably you can find out about my scientific work elsewhere. So this is a picture of me um, more recently than I've seen probably any of you in three dimensions. Um, I am physically located in Ithaca, New York right now. Um, my primary uh, role is as an assistant professor but I am still clinging on at NCAR as a project scientist. Um, I am actually, let's see if we can get the slides to move. Oh yeah, here we go. I am originally from the Great Lakes region, just a little bit east of the southern end of Lake Michigan. Um, one of the things I've been learning about the last few years is the history of our nation, um, including the history before folks came over from Europe. So um, I was lucky enough to grow up in a, an area where there was still some influence of some of the indigenous tribes. So I grew up hearing about the Potawatomi tribe um, who actually has their base in the town where my grandma lived, just a little bit north of where I'm from. Um, now, uh, for those of you who don't know this region of the country, I am 
Also in the Great Lakes region in the same watershed, just a little bit east off this picture. And there's lots of snow, lake effect snow, where I'm from and also where I am now on the ground outside. So I um, went to high school in the Midwest and then I wanted to go away for college. So I went to Miami um, and that was pretty different than living in the Midwest. One of the reasons it's different is because Miami is a place where a lot of cultures come together. And so I learned a lot about um, all kinds of different things, um, speaking different languages and everything. And that was also when I was um, kind of first really experiencing atmospheric science and taking classes on meteorology. I got to spend a summer in Oklahoma working at the National Severe Storms Lab and go storm chasing. Um, and then I Went back to Miami, finished college, um, looking at precipitation. Okay, so this doesn't have nothing to do with um, my scientific identity. Then I went to Seattle, where I uh, did my PhD at the University of Washington. Um, so this is a 21 or something year old me in the front of this picture here. Um, and I, that was seven years of my life. Lots and lots of things happened. I uh, started out with one project. I got disillusioned, got on a boat, went to sea, uh, stared on the bottom of the ocean, looked at a lot of clouds, went back to Seattle, changed a lot of things, got a PhD, working with some wonderful folks. Um, I think in the context of talking about diversity and inclusion. Up to this point, I um, was, you know, aware of myself as a woman um, in science, but I don't think I really felt, um, I don't think I really felt the negative effects of that until after I left grad school. So the next thing I did was come to NCAR um, that's not where I felt any issues actually. So I, I, be, I was an ASP postdoc and, um, and I was in um, the climate analysis section, which is in CGD. And what was really wild for me personally was um, trying to figure out what I was going to do after that. It was kind of the first time I really confronted um, that I needed to find some kind of long-term um, situation for myself if I wanted to be a scientist. And so it was really going on the job market and trying to um, trying to tell myself that uh, I started having a lot of experiences um, where I felt like people didn't take me quite as seriously as I as I wanted them to, as I expected them to, as I had always experienced with people who knew me well. Um, so I suppose that's how I became radicalized. Um, then I managed to um, have some twists and turns through that process. I uh, hung around in Boulder um, as a postdoc in, um, in series for six months before a, a job opened up in the um, climate change research group, also at NCAR as a project scientist. And so I went there. And um, that was great and it was a lot of fun. Um, now I'm a professor, which is also fun and exciting. But during this time when I was a project scientist and I was experiencing a lot of tumult on the job market, so I started this job in uh, 2016, September of 2016. And there were a lot of things happening also more broadly than just in my life. Um, there was a, an election. There uh, was a lot of um, new attention um, paid to the intersection of women and also science being not necessarily taken as seriously as folks would like. And so I ended up getting involved in some things. One of the things was this group called 500 Women Scientists. Um, which started as an open letter of women scientists, women who were scientists who um, wanted to speak out in favor of um, making science more inclusive, acknowledging that it's not, acknowledging that society's not inclusive, um, and making a stand to step up for that. 
Um, I also took the union course as a participant at NCAR, which is really great. If you haven't done it, I recommend it. And, um, and then I kind of stuck around, clung on as a lead learner. Okay, so uh, that's an extended introduction of me, but it also brings us to um, what I wanted to talk about today and what you all asked me here to talk about, which is this guide to inclusive scientific meetings. And so now I will transition to that part of the talk. Talk about humanizing the culture of science by focusing on scientists coming together. Okay, so um, once again, this is me recently. Um, you've seen a few pictures of me as I've grown over time. Um, so that's fun, especially because some of you I actually know pretty well. <laughs> Maybe I haven't gotten to tell you that part of my story. Okay, so um, coming back to this time, 2016, 2017, when I was getting involved with a lot of different organizations, and I started finding myself at um, more and more meetings, getting involved in organizing meetings and finding myself in, um, in spaces that were new to me. So I was working at NCAR, it's part of 500 Women Scientists, the Earth Science Women's Network is um, another organization of women in science that had been around for a lot longer and their mission is more um, peer mentoring. Um, and I found myself at a kind of exclusive workshop organized by the Aspen Global Change Institute. And it was, you know, I had kind of ended up at this invite only meeting because I was the third string and they had invited someone and the person they invited declined and then the person, the backup person also declined and it somehow got kicked to me. And so I ended up at this meeting. And then at the end of the meeting, um, the way that this organization, a lot of what they do is organize meetings. And they would ask people who are already there to propose topics for new meetings. And this was interesting for me because it was apparent that, um, that I had gotten a toehold somewhere that I wasn't super likely to have found myself um, in. So I um, wasn't sure what I would propose scientifically at the time, but I was really um, involved in uh, 500 women scientists activities. And so I said, hey, I mean, we could do something with like inclusion and science and, and stuff. And, um, and they said, hey, what about meetings? What about meetings? <laughs> and um, and, you know, the 500 Women Scientists, kind of a little bit younger crowd, we'd been talking to folks at Earth Science Women's Network who um, kind of had a more traditional, slower approach. Um, and then folks at NCAR also wanted to get involved, but we hadn't had an opportunity. And this is just something that we, we saw that kind of made sense to do. Um, so we really quickly on the on the shoestring budget, put together a weekend workshop that we held um, at NCAR, um, where we got some folks together and talked about diversity and inclusion um, in the context of scientific meetings. It's a really fun um, group of people to get to know a couple, this was the before times. And so it was, um, you know, not trivial that we had a couple of people who joined remotely, um, but it was a, a really powerful um, weekend where I uh, learned a lot and I think a lot of learning started. Um, uh, earlier today, as I was preparing for this, I went back and watched the YouTube video of your um, of the previous session, which was in November or so, with Deb Morrison, who's here, and Heidi Seltzer, who's here. Um, and so this is where a whole bunch of people met and, um, and it was a lot of fun and a lot of things have happened since then. Um, so one of the outcomes of the workshop was this um, document and my name was first because I was the one who coordinated it, not because I was the one who knew the most coming in at all. Um, it was really a lot of the work of the people here and also um, other people who were participants at the workshop um, 
who decided they didn't need to be authors on a final document. The folks I've put in bold here are, are people who have a relationship with NCAR, actually. Um, so Rebecca Hacker, who is also speaking in the series, and AJ Lauer, who is on the call. I think I saw her, which is super exciting. Hello. Great. <laughs> and um, and Luann Thompson, who's on the advisory board for CGP, even though she's a professor at the University of Washington. Um, this document is hosted at NCAR as a technical document, technical report, um, just so in case you wanted to feel a little bit of ownership of it. Um, so I don't think that I, I think I put my slides in the wrong order, but one of the things that I wanted to point out is um, this notion that we, we kind of, the goal, my goal starting out with this was that um, I was, you know, coming at science as a human and of course, I love the science part and the trying to be objective and solve math problems and all of this. But um, I don't think that I ever um, in my time as a scientist could really set aside the fact that I was a human trying to do science. I always had activities on the side that were kind of feeding me and really important for me. And I, um, Many times, I think, over the course of my time in science, felt that um, there was an effort to kind of set aside the fact that we're humans doing science. And that's, um, that's kind of problematic since all of what we're doing is actually done by humans. And so this tension was really getting at me. Um, and this, uh, you know, it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't like I had for my whole time in science said, we, you know, we really need to deal with meetings. But um, instead, what happened was I kind of wandered around wondering, what can I do? And then this opportunity arose. Um, and I said, OK, sure, let's let's do this. It's um, it's got some um, really big advantages. It's, you know, meetings are a place where um, people are coming together from a lot of different institutions that have their own ways of doing things. And that's where a lot of information is exchanged. And that's a lot of where scientific culture is, is set. And so um, in one way, it's uh, you know, something you could leverage to accelerate a lot of change. Um, on the other hand, it was something that people were willing to get together and have a meeting about. And so we could start doing something. Um, okay, and so we're gonna come back to this notion of uh, just getting started on things um, throughout the, the talk throughout going through the guide. And so what I'm gonna do now is kind of um, give you a little bit of the motivation of what is in this guide. Um, I'm gonna focus on kind of the, the high level, the principles and the, um, and the language around it, um, because I think those aren't just relevant for scientific meetings, they're, um, they're relevant at NCAR, they're relevant for wherever you all go after NCAR, if you go somewhere else and stay in science. Um, and I'll briefly touch on the uh, aspects of it that are kind of more specific to scientific meetings. And then we can um, chat in the breakout groups. And I'm really curious to hear what you all think. Um, one, of the, one of the other things that's clear about this is, you know, I have always and still spend most of my time as a scientist. And this is something I do because it um, brings me energy, but that means that I can't I don't have the capacity to become the ultimate expert on it, right? So um, I am giving you a talk right now about this, but I am always also still learning about it constantly. Okay, so um, first thing I wanna do is um, kind of talk about why inclusive scientific meeting. So first, why inclusive? Why did we focus on inclusive? Um, you, a lot of the, a lot of times you will hear about the need to diversify science. So we know that the geosciences are not representative of the population in the US. Um, globally, a lot of geoscience research is done uh, by white people from the global north. Um, and so why aren't we focusing on diversity? Why would we focus on inclusion? Um, I think that part of that is something that has to evolve over time. Uh, at the time when we wrote this document, there was a lot of discussion about 
diversity and there was not a lot of discussion about inclusion. But so why is that important? Um, and I think that the best graphic for this comes from a Nature Geoscience article that actually just came out in 2021. And so um, in this article, they were taking this notion that I think it's been around for quite some time of this leaky pipeline of women in science. You know, how do we how do we end up with a workforce that's not reflective of the population? And, and folks used to talk about a leaky pipeline where women mostly start and then they leave, they have kids and they leave or something like that. Um, and so this article um, led by Asma Berhe and also involving some other folks um, who were involved in this, uh, in our meeting, um, wanted to reframe that as a hostile obstacle course that women and BIPOC researchers have to endure when they're in STEM. And so um, the idea here is that for a lot of the people who um, aren't white, straight men, um, there's bias, there's explicit bias, there's implicit bias. People um, start out skeptical of you, you constantly have to prove yourself. There are lots and lots of things that you've heard about lots and lots of places. Um, and, and so instead of thinking about, um, thinking about people uh, leaving science as a leapy pipeline where some of them just leave, thinking about it as this hostile obstacle course kind of um, is a better illustration of um, people are actually actively being driven out by the system that we have. Um, and so making science inclusive is improving the equity of this situation, getting rid of some of these obstacle course um, obstacles that some people face and other people don't, trying to deal with that. Okay, so, um, so some language that I wanted to share with you. So diversity um, is, I, let's see, I have to move some of these Zoom things that are in the way now. Um, diversity is when we're talking about people, people's different identities. Sometimes they're visible, sometimes they're invisible. And bringing those people together into a space, that's diversity, okay? And so, aha. Uh -huh. Watch out training for PSC. I think that someone might be unmuted. Anyway, okay. Um, so the uh, the reason I want to talk about the the wording is that language is a cultural tool, um, and one of the things that's important is to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, I mean that for this talk, but I also mean that more generally. So this is all things that come directly out of the um, the inclusive meetings guide. So you can go and um, read those or refer to them later. So equity, um, equity is the enactment of specific policies and practices that ensure equitable access and opportunities for success for everyone. Um, and so that's different from equality, um, which is treating everyone the same. Uh, to be equitable, we need to treat individuals according to their needs and provide multiple opportunities for success. Now, inclusion um, is bringing together and harnessing um, that diversity and resources in a way that's beneficial um, and making sure that not only are uh, diverse people and diverse identities present, but also that they're welcomed and that they're supported and um, able to fully um, be present and participate in our meeting or our workplace, these kinds of things. Okay. So um, hopefully you can now have a little bit more context for the catchy thing that I've found myself saying recently, which is that diversity without inclusion is toxic. So um, sometimes you, I, I encounter the notion that um, the, the problem that we have is that science isn't diverse enough. And if we just bring the people in, then uh, everything will get better. But um, 
this hostile obstacle course uh, and the lack of an inclusive atmosphere in a lot of science um, kind of comes together to show that if we take diverse people into a space that's not set up for them, uh, that situation can often be toxic for them and it's not helping anyone. So we can't just have diversity, we also have to have inclusion. That's kind of the idea there. And that's not specific to meetings, that's um, much more general. And perhaps all of you know that because I'm sure that it's a self-selected crowd that's showing up to this meeting. But anyway, that's a um, lot of motivation. Now, why, why meetings? As I kind of, as you kind of heard with the story of how uh, this guide came about, um, part of it was just that that was an opportunity that was present. It was something that we could do that was concrete um, and there were resources to do it and energy to do it. Um, the other reason is because um, it's a potential leverage point where maybe we could accelerate cultural change. And it's also a place where people are quite vulnerable. A lot of times if you travel somewhere, then um, you're meeting a lot of new people, you're in a lot of new situations and you can find stories of things that are sometimes problematic. Um, and so we have this idea that if we're not deliberately working to make everyone present at a meeting or in our workplace included, many are probably excluded. And so it's really important to be proactive about this. I think this is a notion that um, you can find more of now than you could actually in 2018. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot that's happened since we started this work. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through some of the, um, the key principles that we came up with that we wrote down in this guide. And so um, these are pretty straightforward things, but I think that they're pretty powerful and that's why I want to share them with you. Okay, so um, there are eight of these. So we'll go through them one at a time. So the first is to proactively manage implicit bias. So we know that implicit bias happens um, it's important to learn as much as we can about it, recognize that there's some amount of implicit bias that we're not going to be able to wish away, it's going to happen. And so we need to make a plan to minimize its impact. So come up with a rubric to evaluate, you know, people applying to your meeting or people applying to your job um, and, and make sure that you have things uh, set up ahead of time before the people doing the evaluations encounter the implicit bias, these kinds of things. Um, keep in mind that shaming and blaming people for having implicit bias isn't actually productive. That's not gonna um, get you to the outcome of making things more diverse. Um, instead, it's better to have discussions and trainings that are structured in a way that allows people to self-reflect um, in a safe space. Um, second principle is whoever talks has the power. So um, we have a room of people. We have the Zoom room of people. Right now, I'm the one who's speaking. You are listening. So um, being attentive to who gets the opportunity to speak and to have other people's attention um, is one of the ways that we can uh, have a more inclusive space or not. So we need to be attentive to who gets the floor, who gets to get a talk and who only gets a poster at meetings where um, a talk is more prestigious than a poster. That's gonna snowball on itself, right? If you're a grad student and you get a talk at AGU, then you put that on your CV and that gives you a better chance of getting a postdoc later on and more people get to hear what you say. Um, and so um, whoever, whoever is speaking, they have a form of power. And it's important to be attentive to that power dynamic. So it's not only um, planning ahead when you're deciding who is going to get to speak, who, um, where you get to decide who talks and thus who has the power, but also during a meeting. Um, so you can, if, if you're organizing a meeting or if you are, um, introducing a speaker at a seminar series, then you also have a lot of um, say in who gets to participate and how by how you facilitate. And so making sure that you're attentive to um, giving early career scientists the opportunity to speak first 
or using Slido, which was not as common in 2018 and before times. Um, these are ways to make sure that many different people have the opportunity to get a word in. Um, I'm sure that we've all had the experience going to a seminar where the same couple of folks um, ask questions over and over until time has run out. Um, and then many people in the room don't ever get a chance to uh, get their questions heard and answered. Okay, so I think that's a powerful one. Um, the third principle is that participation is not only about who is in the space, but also about how they're doing in the space. And so this is just kind of another way of phrasing this notion that inclusion is important. So um, creating a system that works for, for many, for people with many different and intersecting identities is a prerequisite for making science inclusive. And I think that this is, um, I think this is a really fun, useful way to think about it. Um, the fourth principle is design for universal access. So the idea here is called universal design. It's the notion that if you make a meeting more accessible or a workplace more accessible or anything more accessible to people who have the biggest challenges, then everyone is gonna benefit. If you make a gender neutral restroom, then folks who uh, don't identify on a binary end of the gender spectrum have a place where they feel safe. And women who are waiting in long lines for restrooms also have another option. So this benefits many different people. That's just one example. There are lots of examples that you can find for that. Um, fifth principle is to make your work on equity, diversity and inclusion transparent. So that includes sharing data and assessments, your meetings, your workplace within your organization and also beyond and writing about your efforts, sharing the challenges that you come upon and also the ideas to address them to help keep the community moving forward as a whole. Okay, the, the sixth principle is that demonstrating progress requires data. Establishing baseline data now and monitoring future progress is critical, right? We're scientists and that's how we uh, that's how we know, that's how we measure progress. And it's also how we make arguments to other people is by showing evidence. At the same time, it's really important to collect, store and share the data that we collect responsibly. Be careful about what we ask for and what we do with that as we're keeping it. Be mindful about what it is you ask from people and how you ask for it. This is hard, none of these things are easy. Okay, the seventh principle is to set expectations for appropriate behavior and create structures of accountability in the event of inappropriate behavior. So this is a way of dealing with non-implicit bias, with explicit bias. Um, some people aren't gonna behave appropriately. We're all human and sometimes we might do something that's not appropriate. And so the way to address that is this two-part approach. It's being clear about what the expectations are and then setting up a structure of accountability so that you can address inappropriate behavior and bias. So for example, having a code of conduct, um, having everyone sign a code of conduct and car does this now. Um, that's one way you can make it clear to everyone in writing what it is that's expected of them, what it is that's appropriate, getting everyone on the same page about that. And then also making sure that there's a structure of accountability for that, making sure that people know where to go to report things and making sure that there's a way that you can remove problematic situations, make sure there's a way you can address them. I'm all, that's also not an easy thing to do, but it's an important thing to do. And then the last of the principles is to attend to who is doing the work. Make sure you ask who is doing the work of making your science inclusive and also of doing your science. So science and also making science inclusive will take work and that work can be an opportunity and or it can be a burden. So what are the ways that you can support that work and what resources are available to support it? And also is the credit for the work aligned with who is doing the work? They're all important questions to consider and there are a couple of more in the guide as well.
Okay, so those are the principles that um, that I learned that I, I, we were able to articulate um, in the guide through this process. And then enacting those, specifically in the context of scientific meetings, give you a really quick overview of that. Um, so we um, wanted to call it, we, talked, we, we called the document how to, how to Get Started, Where to Start, right? Um, and we structured it in terms of um, time, what you do before a meeting, during, and then after a meeting. So key parts are um, before the meeting, build a representative organizing team, choose diverse speakers, and consider who gets to participate carefully. Make sure you gather the resources to support all the participants. That might mean finding extra funds um, to make your uh, meeting um, more inclusive, make sure that, you're at, that you have universal access. Um, and lay the groundwork for respectful interactions at the meeting through your pre-meeting communication. During the meeting, make sure you attend to this principle that participation is not only about who's in the space, but also how they're doing in the space. I think that's a fundamental driving principle with this component. And then after the meeting, make sure you collect feedback, synthesize it and learn from what happened and learn from um, how your participants experienced this event and make sure you're attentive to who is doing the work and who's getting credit. Okay, so that's about scientific meetings, but um, I realized that this particular seminar series is happening at NCAR. And so I wanted to mention briefly that NCAR has a really unique role in atmospheric sciences. So it's a hub for atmospheric and climate science, hosting visitors, hosting guests, hosting workshops, hosting students. Um, in some ways, NCAR is like one giant extended meeting. Folks are coming through from all over the place. It's really a hub. And so just like at meetings, if we're, if we're not deliberately working to make sure everyone present at NCAR is included, then many are likely excluded. So I think that this is just as important every day at NCAR as it is um, in a lot of other contexts. Okay, so last thing I wanna mention, I touched on a couple of times, but it's thinking about what's next, about continuing to move forward. So one of the mm, unstated principles is that this all is always a work in progress. Um, we're each on a journey where we learn new things every day and hopefully don't forget too much of what we learned before. Um, and so we need to make sure that uh, we provide support for other people to enter this work um, and that we commit to continuing to do it regardless of our experience, expertise, or our comfort levels. It's going to be uncomfortable some of the time. So the, the meeting and also the guide were meant um, as a start for that group of people collectively and many of us individually, and hopefully also for readers, give folks a toehold. It's not meant to be um, the final say. And we know, we knew that it wasn't perfect. So that means we have to get over perfectionism, which um, is a common um, affliction of scientists and expect that we're not gonna get everything right on the first try, but we're gonna commit to learning from our mistakes and continuing on anyway. The guide came, started the meeting and we had the meeting in 2018 and the guide came out in 2019 and um, it's about time to update it. And so thankfully some folks um, have taken on the mantle of leading the charge forward and, um, and up doing the work of updating the guide, which I am very happy about because a lot has happened since then, which maybe we'll get to address in the breakout question. So um, that is all I have for you today. And so I am excited for the breakout session. Awesome, thank you, Angie. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I learned a lot and hopefully others did too. Um, but yeah, breakout sessions, uh, I think we're gonna go to that next. So I'll just share briefly what that's going to look like. Um, we're just going to do 10 minutes, so we actually have time to get to some of the Slido questions, because um, those are really great too. Uh, and so we have some guided questions for you, which I'll post in the chat. 
um, to consider. And I would just focus on the first one. If that's all you can get through, great. If you can make it to others, awesome. Um, but these are some things we'll discuss within our breakout rooms. Um, and then we'll come back at the end for the last 10 minutes or so to address the Slido questions. So um, Jenny, if you wanna start putting everyone Uh, sweet. So yeah, sorry the breakout rooms are always too short, um, but we'll wrap up just by addressing some of these questions that were submitted via Slido. Um, and I think everyone is back. I see Angie's back too. So um, yeah, we can just start with the first question here. Um, so Angie, if you would like to field these questions, we'd love to hear your thoughts on these. Um, okay. But can I also... Can other people jump in if they want to? Because I know that other people also know lots of things. Anyway, um, totally. I don't. Yeah, you know, we can see how that how that works. Okay. Do you want to read the question, Erin? Yeah. Or yeah, I can read it. Um, so it looks like the upvoted question from Rachel um, says, "I've always thought the inclusion of alcohol um, being the most egregious at scientific meetings whoop, whoop, can be exclusionary." Sorry, sorry you're good, <laughs> and lead to inappropriate experiences. However, I know that these activities uh, and things also bring people together. Do you have any thoughts on how we might address this culture? Um, this is, a, this is a, a great question that I have a strong opinion about, but um, before I uh, start on my answer, one of the things that came up in, in my breakout group was um, that there are just not easy answers to a lot of questions, right? There are pluses and minuses. So um, alcohol, one of the problems is that um, alcohol makes people feel emboldened and um, it probably, I think pretty definitively can end up leading to more instance, incidences of harassment, right? There are um, a lot of people who don't feel more included when folks around them are drinking a beer at their poster. Personally, I'm allergic to beer and I'm um, not very good at drinking. I get get hung over real quickly. And so um, one thing that drove me nuts at AGU for the longest time is they have beer in the afternoon and then you wouldn't be able to find the tea anymore. So um, at the very least, you know, if you're going to have alcohol, you should have some options for things that aren't um, alcohol nearby. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard because you want, you know, you want to get people interacting, but there are some big costs to doing that through beer. Um, so perhaps we can convince people that that's not necessary. I don't know. I'm glad I don't have to make that call. Yeah, that's one thing about being virtual. We don't have to worry about it anymore for better or worse. So um, that's one change. But yeah, that's, that's a really, really tough one to answer. Um, but I agree, more options would be really nice. Um, so the next question, um, oh, thanks Mimi, um, she's hopping off now. So the next question is from Andy Newman. So he asks, could you talk about the environments in grad school and your early years at NCAR that perhaps helped you not feel the negative aspects of being a woman in science early on and what changed as you progress at NCAR and now at Cornell? Yeah, so um, so the thing that I think was so helpful for me, uh, actually in all the places where I've been kind of, you know, employed, when when the the way I'm being evaluated and whether or not I get to keep having a job is based on people who know me and based on, you know, like evaluation of my work, you know, my professors grading my homework assignments and really seeing that I'm smart and that I make contributions. Um, those are experiences where I've been really lucky and um, have had people who are impressed by me and took me seriously um, because I 
could do good work. And, um, and the problems that I had are almost always when I go out into the world and meet new people. So the thing that's so that, um, that really got me as a postdoc going out on the job market was, um, people were, you know, deciding whether or not to further consider you for a job for a, like a long-term situation on a lot of times on the basis of really not that much information, not knowing you very well, having one brief conversation, showing up somewhere. And, you know, I, I'm a short woman. My voice is kind of high pitched. I guess I'm not that good at acting really serious, even though, um, you know, until I, until I'm really grilling somebody on a, on a problem where I think they're wrong. Um, And so in these kind of more casual situations that are really important when you're trying to make that jump, I, I was really feeling the effects of how people kind of perceived me as a, as I am embodied um, more so than seeing me on the basis, knowing me on the basis of my work over a long period of time. Um, That's, that's how I've interpreted it. Yeah. So um, I was watching uh, Deb and Heidi's talk from last time. And one of the things that they were mentioning was um, how important it is not to make assumptions about people and, um, you know, to hold space for people to be, uh, to make a contribution and not make assumptions about them. Um, You know, I can't help but uh, assume that folks see me being a, a short woman who looks pretty young and making the jump that then maybe I'm, I'm, you know, not super good at uh, stochastic calculus. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Angie. I know a few people have to hop off. Um, I should ask you, Angie, if you have to leave now, we can wrap this up. Um, otherwise, okay, I see you shaking I'm your head. Right. Um, so if people want to stick around, maybe just like five extra minutes, if we can, you know, maybe get through some of these questions, if you have to leave, totally fine. Um, this is great discussion. So I, I'm curious to hear some some more about these questions. Um, so we'll just continue till like five past the hour. Um, but yeah, thanks for everyone who's joined thus far. So anyway, uh, thanks for that prior answer, Angie. I think a lot of people can relate to that, um, feeling of being judged on, your exterior and not your work, uh, which is really unfortunate. Um, So the next question is, how do you think inclusivity has changed with most scientific meetings being virtual now? Uh, What can we do better? (laughs) That's a great question and I have no idea. I mean, um, I think this is, you know, right. So I've, I've started a new job and lots of things have happened in my life in Corona time and I haven't uh, had the capacity to put a lot of energy into evaluating the meetings I've been involved with. So I don't think I'm even the best person to answer this question. I hope that people are getting feedback. And um, I wonder if people like AJ might actually have something to say. Yeah, I was th- I was just thinking. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I was the inclusivity chair for a large scientific meeting back in November. And so um I've been working on this problem in the virtual slash hybrid environment quite a lot in the last two years. I would say that one of the challenges that I have seen is that we have to be inclusive in all parts again, and we have to rethink what all of those parts are, right? So if we are in a virtual environment, do we have subtitles? Are you doing closed captioning on the fly or are you not releasing it until the next day when a, you know, a computer algorithm can come in and do it? There do, there are, um, you can, I think it's Vizio or Vimeo or something will do it on the fly for you while people are speaking. And so are you going to engage those kinds of softwares to make it so that people who have hearing impairments can read the text of what is happening in your meeting? Um, We mentioned, you know, being able to ask questions through things like Slido. Slido, we found, was actually really huge in making our meetings more inclusive. It also made things safer in the coronavirus time because we can require even people who are sitting in a room to put their questions in through Slido. And so then you are not privileging the people who are in the room and you can continue to do that, you know, the upvoting type thing for all the questions and you don't just end up with, you know, the person who has access to the mic gets access to all of the the speaking time, which as Angie mentioned earlier, um, the person who's talking has the power, right? So um, 
I think that there are ways in which scientific meetings are much more inclusive. It makes it easier for parents to attend meetings um, because we don't have to leave. Uh, It makes it easier for people who maybe can't afford hotels for weeks on end to attend because they can stay in their own homes and that can help broaden participation among people who don't have the financial means to attend conferences for whatever reasons. Um, But I think that it also means that we have to rethink what that inclusivity means and, and how we implement that in the virtual or the hybrid space. Thanks, AJ. Um, I want to also throw in that um, I have, I get really bad headaches from looking at screens, from looking at videos on screens. I'm very, very sensitive to it. And it's gotten worse as I've gotten older. I have a hard upper limit of two hours a day on Zoom. And that means that I have to say no to a lot of things. Um, I think that's really hard. This was actually something we talked about at the meeting in 2018. Um, was, you know, should we even be going to meetings? A lot of us are climate scientists and it's somewhat hypocritical of us to be spending our carbon budgets on physically going to meetings. And at the time, and where I'm still at with it, though I don't know where other people are, um, I think that there are some interactions that are just too hard to do online. I'm not sure that I can really, um, there are a lot of relationships I don't think I can build just with online interactions. And maybe that's because I have such a hard time with Zoom. I think a much harder time than most people have. Um, And so maybe there's a balance to be struck between having hybrid meetings and having virtual meetings um, and still occasionally meeting in person. I don't know. And providing ways for people to interact that aren't just the Zoom windows. Um, One of the things we did was set up a Discord server for the conference so that people could interact over text. And it created a virtual hallway based on topic areas that people could meet one another um, and hang out. And people from the conference requested that we keep that open for a full month and a half after the conference because they liked it so much and they were developing such great relationships. That was a nice accommodation that we made that got everybody off the video screen. Yeah, this is fantastic. I think we could have a, a separate seminar just on virtual meetings and how that works. Um, for the sake of time, I think we can probably just answer one more question. Um, so the next one is from Michael Diamond asking, how robust is the current literature on inclusive meetings? Were you able to find data on everything you wanted when making the report? Or is it really important to be collecting data at future conferences, et cetera, to figure out what works best? Um, definitely there is not a robust literature that the document that we put together was something of a start, right? It was whoever we could find on short notice with not very much money to show up and talk with us and, you know, our brainstorming and then like putting it out there and seeing what happens with it. That, that's where it was at. It was not like, oh, everyone has robustly tested every one of these ideas. Definitely not definitely need to take a lot more data. And, and I, um, I know the idea originally was to um, have some, um, some folks testing things. So I know AGCI actually in, in implemented a bunch of feedback in their meetings. Um, I'm not sure if they ended up getting the iteration that they wanted because you know the world went into the pandemic <laughs> shortly after all this started, but, um, but definitely that it, it, it's really important to collect data and collect feedback and um, learn uh, going forward and iterate. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Yeah, do we have, okay, I don't know where people are feeling right now, but we have one question. Do we have time for it or people tapped out? We can't even figure out a good waiting scheme for um, climate models. I don't know how we would do it for this. (laughs) That's a tough one. (laughs) Nice try. It sounds good. I don't know how to do that though. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm not the best person to ask about this, but that's my, that's my flippant response. Well, on that note, that gives us something to, to continue thinking about how we could improve. Um, but I'll end here since I know it's well past the hour and Angie, I'm honored you joined us given your Zoom limit. So uh, I know you have like 40 minutes left in you and we'll, we won't hold you back too much. So thanks everyone for joining. Really, really appreciate it. Great discussion. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of your day.
It's great to see so many of you. 